Hello, everybody, and welcome to another amazing Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. My name is Jesse, and if you are new to our programs, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And not only that, but we are on the most epic road trip of all time. If you have joined us, we've been going coast to coast to coast with the amazing teams at Parks Canada and Canadian Geographic Education on an adventure like no other. You can check out all the past programs that we've done at the link below and the programs to come over the next month or so. We are going back to the Arctic. We are going to visit Anna Green Gables out in PEI. We are doing so much to instill you with the wonder and magic of Canada's park system with a whole slew of education resources to keep the learning going. Now, a few quick housekeeping notes before we dive in with today's program. Number one, not only is this an amazing series, it is a chance to win real prizes for your class. And so, if you go to the Canadian Geographic Education site, we'll make sure all our registered classes have this at the end of the broadcast, you can take what you learned today and put it towards a contest where you could win real prizes for your classroom. So check that out. It's an amazing link, an amazing way to keep involved after the broadcast is done. And secondly, today, we are going to have a little bit of a Kahoot quiz together interspersed with our broadcast. And so I will put this up before we bring up our first questions as well, but I did want to leave Kahoot.it with our game pin on the screen for just a second. I'll put this in our YouTube chat in a minute as well. If you want to pull that up on a separate tab on your computer, get ready for those questions. Get ready to be interactive. You won't win anything, but you will win the bragging rights and the everlasting respect of both me and our Parks Canada friends today. So today, we are going all the way up to Inuvik in the Northwest Territories to learn about raptors in the far north, birds of prey in one of the most iconic and beautiful and remote places on this planet. I am so excited to dive in. I hope you are as well. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our friends at the Western Arctic Field Unit team. Welcome in, guys, and take us away. <laughs> Hi, Jesse. Thanks for that introduction. My name is Ellen, and this is my coworker, Peyton, and we're joining you today from Inuvik, Northwest Territories. Inuvik is a small community. It's about 3,000 to 4,000 people. It's located on the traditional territories of the Inuvaluit and the Gwich'in people. It's about 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle and just a little south of the Arctic coast. It's a beautiful, beautiful town. It experiences 24 hour darkness for one month of the year and 24 hour light for two months of the year. Temperatures here can be as low as negative 50 sometimes and as high as positive 30 in the summer. And today we're gonna to be talking to you about raptors. And we study these birds. No, we don't mean the dinosaurs. When we say raptors, we mean eagles, falcons, hawks, and birds of prey. And we study them in a park known as Tuktuk Nogait National Park. It's located in the eastern side of the Northwest Territories, right along the Nunavut and NWT border. So before we dive into the content about these birds, we're gonna watch a quick video about Peyton preparing for a trip into Tuktuk Nogait. For a hiking trip, it's an 85 liter pack that's going to probably weigh about 60 pounds. Some of the content we need for this trip, some important things is a bear barrel that store all your food in it. Um, also, double security is we do freeze dried food that's all smelled, food sealed up, closed up, stored in the bear barrel, so it's super secure. That's our food and storage. Surfaces next to it here is our cooking device, the fuel. Pot and stove all in one it sits here. Fill this up with water, boils water in two minutes. Heats these up, boils water, heats these up in 10 minutes. Good to go. You'll be eating a nice meal. Next thing important is making sure you have a proper filtration system that fits right onto your water bottle. So we have the Nalgene filtration system that fits onto the Nalgene bottle, screws in, filters all the bacteria and particles in the water that we get in the field that we're not packing. 20 pounds of water, so good item to have. Um, a Leatherman, super important, has knives, pliers, tools, everything you need that you may need out in the field if something comes up. So always good to have. Following that is your camping equipment, which is also important. This is what protects you during the night. You have a nice lightweight, four season, two person tent here. Able to fit all your gear in it during the night. You got a nice lightweight thermorex that's Packs away, compact, but the size of your Nalgene bottle. Um, sleeping bag, another one that packs the same size as this. It's tucked away in the bag right now, right in the bottom, secured in a dry sack, so it's all put away properly. 
Hex is your first aid kit. This is a three-person trip, so we have a larger first aid kit that has everything from removing objects to uh, um, relocating bones to burns to just open wounds, band-aids, everything you need, something that for medic medicine. It's all there. On top of that, we also carry a cell phone that's our emergency contact device to communicate with the office here. Super handy, you can act as a walkie-talkie so you can chat with them or a cell phone. Always take that in the field. Then the next of items is our survey equipment. We have maps, GPS devices, we put all of our locations and our routes on this GPS that we follow and use while we're in the field, go to all the points. Look for nests. The way we look for nests is with the spotting scope. Sets up pretty simple on the ground. You just sit there, put this up, and scan the cliffs, the cliff edges, all for a raptor nest, any sign of raptors, any birds, all along the edge. Spend about 15 minutes at each side looking around. Um, so yeah, all this equipment fits into that pack. That pack goes onto your back, and you're hiking with it. So your entire life for 10 days is on your back. To be able to move, you need some good hikers. So today, I carry a nice Morel boot, low ankle. I like my ankles kind of exposed to cool down, but 100% waterproof. So super important to have good quality, nice supporting hikers for the trip. Um, yeah, so that's it. all the items, all the contents you need for the Raptor Survey to 2 million. Very cool. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. And I think we're going to jump into a couple of Kahoot questions now. We sure are. All right, folks. So what I'm going to do is just give you guys a second to get in with that Kahoot. I know quite a few of you have already done so, which is awesome. Let's play together. And if you don't have Kahoot, if you don't want to play along that way, that's totally fine, too. You can answer these questions in your classes. For those who are new to this, too, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Uh, we've got all our fantastic names today. In fact, we've got quite a few people named after Birds of Prey, which I think is pretty exciting, guys. So you guys can help us out with clues in the final few seconds here, but we are going to get underway with this quiz. There will be more questions later on in the broadcast too, but we're going to start off with just a couple. All right, I'm ready. Are you guys ready? Do it. How much? Hayden's backpack weigh. 100 pounds, 60 pounds, 25 pounds, 10 pounds. I know it won't look like that. Your backpack's going to look much more rugged and epic than that one. That was quite the <laughs> back We have six answers. Oh, we, we, we really confused them today. Seven seconds left, guys. Get those answers in. Hmm, 10 pounds for all that? What do we think? I don't know. One more second. 10 days, not 10 pounds. <laughs> 60 pounds. A 60-pound pack, which is a very, having carried a 50-pound pack in my life, good for you for being able to carry a 60-pound pack for 10 days. That is not easy. All right, let's see what our, our answer is. Do you want to tell us a little more about 60 pounds before we go to our next question? Or just keep yeah, going? Yeah, so it's basically, yeah, everything you need for the 10 days, carrying on your pack. Um, you make sure you have that nice, comfy, proper fitting pack so it, you don't really feel it. If you have it set properly, you should have space between your shoulders and the straps. And all you, most of your weight should be actually on your hips. So you're carrying it with your hips and it's nice and secured and comfy on your back. So, yeah, it's all about the backpack and fitting the proper backpack to be able to support 60 pounds. So, so little did our kids know that going to school with your backpack every day, you are training for epic raptor expeditions in Canada's north, which I think is very exciting. So let's head yeah, to our next question. We process. always have double straps. <laughs> <laughs> Sturdy fan is in our lead. Where is our park located in the Northwest Territories? Ooh, who did their research before the program? It isn't in the Northwest Territories. Total lie. Where we're just, we're faking it. Is it on the east side, close to the Nunavut border? Is it just outside Yellowknife? Or is it just above the Alberta border? Oh, some geography. We've got some American classes in today, too. Might be a little more. You gotta remember, it's above the Arctic Circle. Yeah. So that uh, would eliminate a few of the answers. That <laughs> does. Oh, wow. Most people got that right. On the east side of the Northwest Territories, close to the border. Way to go, nice. guys. Bravo. Good job. Well, we'll, we'll wrap our quiz for there. You guys can tell us a little bit more about that, and we'll have more questions ready when we come back in just a little bit. Awesome. Perfect. Over here. Yeah, so like I said, the eastern border is along the NWT Nunavut border. Kind of a fun fact, actually, uh, back in 1998 when they were doing the uh, uh, chats and talks about making this park, it was supposed to extend into that Nunavut border and include Blue Nose Lake, this large lake here. 
Um, but it kind of did some delays and they just speeded up the process and it ended up staying just in the NWT. So that's why it uses the NWT border uh, as its eastern boundary, which is a kind of unique. Could have been a Nunavut and NWT shared jurisdiction national park, but didn't work out. Maybe in the future. Um, here we'll dive into more of the um, raptors that we'll see. So we'll start talking about being in the field and what we're looking for, kind of some clues we're kind of keeping out for. So here we have the four main species that nest in took to know guide. So up in the top left corner, you have the deer falcon, which is a unique species. It actually can spend all winter up here if it wants, if it chooses to. Its main food source is ptarmigan, so they stay here all winter. You have the rough-legged hawk, which is one of the more common species up here. You have the golden eagle, which is the largest species in Tuktunogai. And cliff nests are also very unique species. Then, then the cool fastest, one of the fastest birds is the peregrine falcon. Um, another common species up there, rough leg hawk, pe peregrine falcons, the two common ones. Um, so when we're in the field, we're trying to identify them. And as you can see, it's kind of hard to distinguish what bird is what. So here I'll talk about the rough leg hawk specifically in the top right corner. And if you look at it closely, it's kind of brown and white bird in general, but there's two brown patches that are squares on the underside of its elbow. Those are common features and distinctive patterns to identify it as a rough leg hawk. So I always look for brown elbows, I call it. And that's how I know it's a rough leg hawk. And then if you look at the peregrine falcon down in the bottom, it's a fast, unique species by its flight patterns. But if you can see its color, you can actually see it has a helmet on. So it has like sideburns that go around the top of the head and then down the other side. We call that the dark helmet on the peregrine falcon. And that's one of the main features to tell them between the deer falcon and peregrine falcon. Um, so those are some features you can see by coloration, if the bird's close enough, if they fly in over you. But most times it's a little more difficult than just the colors. And we got to use silhouettes because they're way off in the distance, flying away when they spot us, taking off. So here... You have a kind of an easy one up in the top left. You have the snowy owl, the round round head with kind of rough feathers all the way around, feathers right to the feet, distinguish the owl. So the round head is the biggest thing you're looking for in the owl. Um, up here is the rough-legged hawk on the top right. And it's a large silhouette, large wide tail. But the biggest key features are these fingertips off the tip of its wings. So its fingers run all the way to the top of its wing. And there's like the thumb, I call it, at the top side on the rough-legged hawk. And if you look at the golden eagle, that's the main feature to tell them apart in their silhouette. Because there's no finger on the top. It's eliminated in the rough golden eagle. And it's all off the end of the wing. So those are kind of harder features to tell. But that's what you're looking for in the field when they're way off in the distance. Then, then you have the falcon species here, which is very... Pointed wings, pointed tail, smooth feathers, designed for quick flying, dive bombing animals, chasing birds. So they're very swift, very pointed features, small birds, kind of easy to tell. Um, peregrine falcon and deer falcon, very similar silhouette. So it's eliminated to two of the four species. Um, if we move on here, we'll go. So that's what we're looking for in the birds. Where we're looking for them is along the cliffs on the rivers. So the main rivers in Tuktunogai is the Hornaday, which flows straight through the center of the park all the way up. It's a very large canoe, uh, canoeable river system. Then, then you have the Brock River, which is very class four, class five rapids through a short, steep section of canyons, suitable habitat. And then the Roscoe River, which is flows into the Nunavut border up in the northeast corner. Those are main habitats, but the Raptor hike focuses on the Hornaday River because that's the largest Park, uh, river that breaks up the park and it has the most cliffs in it. So we focus specifically on that. Uh, as we're walking the canyon walls, we kind of just stay on top the uh, flat surfaces up top. We never get down. It's no point in getting down. So what we're looking for is this pillar here. That's a very isolated, nice secluded place for a nest for a peregrine falcon. So here we'll kind of go into what we're looking for when we're uh, looking for the nest along these canyons. It's uh between the bird adults and the silhouettes that we talked about and the features that we see along the cliff. So here we can look for the most obvious one, which is the whitewash rocks, this bottom picture. You see there's a nest here, rough-legged hawks sitting in the nest. And then right below it, there's a huge, almost looks like white paint below it. And that's actually the bird poop from it sitting on the nest pooping. 
And that's a distinctive feature that there's a nest or a perch site around. And if there's a perch site around, it's most likely going to be close to a nest site. So if we notice that, we spend a little more time using that spotting scope I talked about in the video to identify what species is using it. Um, a little more difficult features when we're looking for a nest or find a nest is this peregrine falcon nest up here in the top. All it is, it's on a grassy ledge. If you're looking up from the river, it just looks like grass growing, nothing really there. So with that features and very noisy adults that are flying over you, being very defensive, making a lot of screeching noises, coming down, checking you out, really monitoring you and keeping you away from the nest. You know there's something there, so you spend a little more time. And usually what you end up finding is one of these two pictures. This one here is a hawk stick nest, very thick camouflage. But if you spend enough time, you can notice it and see it. Um, so we're always trying to identify what we're looking for along the nests here. Once we find the nests, um, the next step is actually figuring out what's in the nest. So it, since we have four different species, these species nest, lay eggs, and fly away from their nest at very different times throughout the summer. How, that's how they're able to live in the same area at the same time is, for example, the deer falcons are the very first raptors that lay their eggs in the Tuktunoga. They lay it in May, uh, early May. They, Like I mentioned earlier, they can spend all winter up here. So they're early nesters. They get the first pick. They get prime nesting areas. The next is the golden eagles. And they're kind of later into May. They have a long time before they can fly away from their nest. So they got to get early. Um, peregrine falcons, they show up late. They're nesting by mid to late June. So those guys are a little after these ones. And then the rough-legged hawks are mid-June. They nest there as soon as the lemmings are available. Um, so what we're looking, those are the eggs we're looking for. So it's kind of unique features here. rough leg hawk white with brown spots. Peregrine falcon brown with brown spots. So you have to I, have an idea of what the eggs look like. So here we have some replicas below the screen. So we can practice when we're not in the field and check them out. So we uh, come down to the lab and work with some of the replicas just to get an idea of what we're looking for in the field. So also, like I said, very different times of uh, laying their eggs. So it can also be young. So here's the rough legged hawk at 14 days old. Very small, very fluffy feathers. Um, twice as old here as the peregrine falcon. Like I said, they grow fast. They nest late. So their young grow really fast. Here's 32 days old. And it already has adult feathers, tail feathers, skin their flight feathers. So it's kind of uh, quick growing. Golden eagle. Look at how close they look. Between 32 days and 56 days in the golden eagle. So these guys take a long time to grow. They grow much larger before they can fly. Their body's heavier. And then you have the deer falcon, which is a little slower growing. Like I said, they nest early, so they have a little longer summer to grow. So here's 30 days, uh, deer falcon with fluffy feathers, 32 days peregrine with flight feathers. So it varies depending on the species, and that's how they're able to live together within the uh, within close to a kilometer or so apart from each other. So it's they have a unique relationship to be able to survive together. Um, so the purpose of all of these hiking trips and monitoring and finding the nest is monitoring and understanding what's happening to these bird species within their nesting grounds, how they nest, how they reuse their nest, how do they change their habitat type depending on uh, food availability. So here's a picture of a golden eagle stick nest. It's over 10 meters high. I've actually seen this one physically. It's an active nest still. Many generations have used it, and year after year, every summer, they'll come back and put sticks on it, build it up, build it up. So this is a very unique one. One of the monitoring we do, we want to see how long and how often they use the same nest. So prime example that they use it quite often in this one here. Um, very thick. Uh, and then we're also monitoring for any changes. As we know, climate change is a huge effect all over the world. And with climate change, some of the biggest noticeable uh changes happening up here is this erratic weather pattern. So weird weather, kind of one day you can have snow, one day you can have rain, then the next day it can be 30 degrees and then next day it's hail. Very weird, throwing out of the no consistency in the weather pattern. So it causes a lot of precipitation. So you can see standing water, which affects the nest ultimately. That's the biggest effect on raptors, which causes nest failure, nest collapsing. Uh, the structure that the nest is sitting on doesn't have any more support, too much water, kind of washing it away, causing slums, causing the nest to fall, 
nests to fail. So here, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually, this was an active nest earlier in the summer. I came across it. The nest had collapsed due to rain. And I found an egg there that's not going to be successful due to the collapsing. So we're monitoring changes in the environment. And then also, because we're out in the field, we can see what new species come into the area. So this picture is taken in town here, but last summer in Tuktunoga, we actually had a local member observe and record a bald eagle observation in Tuktunoga. Very first one ever to be recorded in Tuktunoga. So we know they're moving north. They're going to out compete the golden eagle. So it's something we got to continue monitoring and watching out for. So we want to know what's happening in their summer habitat to be able to compare it to what's happening in their winter habitats in the south. Um, so yeah, so that's the main kind of monitoring purpose of this trip, but kind of switch to some of my uh, personal favorites, kind of what I like to do, why I'm in, um, so interested and passionate about raptors is because I enjoy hiking. I enjoy getting out there, being in the field and identifying these raptors. I like that challenge of trying to say, oh, is that a peregrine? Is it a deer falcon? And trying to identify, take a few steps, get a little closer to get a better view. Always a challenge out there. So this is me in the field on the raptor survey. My entire pack's there. See how it fits really nice. Most of my weight's actually on my hip. Um, probably looking at a raptor telling my buddies who's taking the picture, hey, you see that raptor over there? You should see it. It's right there. I'm telling them, but they can't see it because my eyes are a little more trained. Um, so it's a lot of fun being out there looking for the raptors. My ultimate favorite that I'm always on the lookout for but doesn't actually nest in Tuktuno guy is this beautiful snowy owl. Um, very versatile, very large animal, but swift and quiet for hunting. Uh, ambushes its voles, lemmings, mice under the snow. Um, but it's able to adapt to a lot of changes. And if the food availability isn't there in the north, it actually migrates south and it lives in the south for a year or two. Hangs out in southern Canada looking for voles. Some years you can see many sitting on... Uh, fence posts along fields. Some years there's none. That's because in the north, food availability is not there when they're in the south. And if they're not there, it's healthy in the north. So very versatile. Um, they're able to adapt and lay eggs according to what's available. So here is a very healthy snowy owl nest in Olivic National Park where they nest up on Banks Island, high Arctic. It's eight eggs. That's a very large um, clutch for a snowy owl. But you can see here around the edge of it is lemming. And you know it's a healthy year for their food source. So the adults are actually stockpiling all the food to help support these eight young. So right now they have three chicks, five eggs. These eggs will hatch within the next three, four days. And then there'll be eight chicks, hopefully. And then they'll have lots of food sources around them. So they're prepping, adapting to what's coming and being able to raise their young. So very versatile animals. Snowy owls are cool, unique animals. Um, yeah, so... That's about it on my end. I love scanning the cliffs. If I can sit out in these cliffs all day long, I would. But if you have any questions, here's the time. Fantastic. Man, if you guys ever need a volunteer, sign me up. I'll fly out there. It'll be a freaking hoot and a half. Um, guys, <laughs> let's dive in with our Kahoot. We're going to do two last questions before we dive in with our questions. We've already got a ton of questions coming in on YouTube, and I love the enthusiasm. Bunch of live classes already as well. But as a reminder, before we get underway, if you guys want to join the Kahoot you haven't already, get that quiz up. And I think for you two, I, I think you'll join me in rooting for Clever Eagle to win this one. Sturdy Panda's currently got our lead, but we, we should have a Raptor win this, I think, just for to be very fitting. Uh, but let's go to Raptor. Yeah. Clever <laughs> Eagle. <laughs> All right, we learned this at the beginning of the presentation. What are the four major Raptor species, Parks Canada studies, in the park? So we've got Golden Eagle, Peregrine, Deer Vulcan, Rough-Legged Hawk, Velociraptor, Utah Raptor, Over Raptor, and Deinonychus. That could be it. We did do a dinosaur program a couple weeks ago, but I doubt it somehow or other. you got a bit of time. I know you have to read a lot. Don't think too hard. Might be that first one. Two more seconds to go. All right. Yeah. Let's see what we got. Most of you guys got Ooh. that right. That's wow. awesome. Way to go. Okay. That's our leaderboard looking like. Sturdy Panda keeps the lead. We've got a hawk in the top four. Okay. Our final question. Mm -hmm. Then we can get those Q&A questions ready, everybody. What is a big threat to raptors in Tuk -tuk National Park? Climate change, nest collapse, invasive species moving north, or all of the above? Now, I will say, for our classes that are used to my cahoots, this answer is the same that my answer always is when it's an option on these cahoots. So our, our amazing Arctic field unit uh, preempted me with this question. Three seconds left. 
We've got our final, all of the above. So yes, all of these are threats. Some of you jumped the gun with some of those early ones. There's a lot of threats facing raptors. There's also a lot of work being done to understand and protect them. And I think we'll get into more of that in our Q&A today. But before we dive in, our, our, our final podium, amiable camel, smooth dog, and we're all hoping for a raptor here. Number one is, it's Clever Eagle. Oh, no. Right, you couldn't scratch. Yeah, go. If you Good are, job, everybody. <laughs> Let us know who you are. That's awesome. Uh, and before we dive with Q&A too, I will note we've been doing this the whole Parks Canada series on the road trip. If you guys have additional questions after the broadcast is done, we are going to have a Padlet for you. So a virtual whiteboard. You'll be able to share questions there after the fact for our amazing Parks team. So let's get underway. Uh, Rolling Acres, if you guys want to join us first in Manitoba, you are good to go. Off of the country. Hello, Colony School. Welcome in. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining. <laughs> oh, a little nervous today, but do you have any questions for our team? I think Jonah has a question, yes. Hey, man. How fast can a falcon fly? How fast can a falcon fly? Great question. That's a good one. Um, I don't know the speed actually on the top of my head. Uh, the peregrine falcon, they're one of the fastest flying, but when they're free falling, dropping from the sky, tucked all in, they can reach like 160 kilometers an hour diving down. So I don't know their free fly, like their flying speed, but their dive bombing speed, yeah. It's it's crazy. Like the fa not, only, not only the fastest bird on earth, but the fastest animal of any kind. Like a cheetah is blown out of the water by the peregrine falcon. I knew we were gonna get this one. So, okay, our first question, a bit of a stumper. I like that one. Stump the Scientist is our favorite game in these parks programs. <laughs> I like so, it. Uh, we're gonna keep that keep that going. Uh, Miss Mustard's class joining us. Welcome in guys in Ontario. If you guys have a question for us, unmute your mic and come on in, take us away. Hello. Who's got one? She's on her way. Yes, she's on her way. Hey. What is the lifespan of a snowy owl? The lifespan of a snowy owl. Great question. They can live very old. They are actually uh, pretty um, robust animals, and they have a long lifespan, but it all depends on the predators or food availability in the area. But I know that I've worked with one snowy owl, not in Parks Canada when I was working on Herschel Island, and it was up to like 13 years old. So it was a very old snowy owl that had passed by Herschel Island quite often. Yeah, I do encourage our classes too. If you want to look up Herschel Island when you're done this broadcast, you've worked in the coolest places. This is so neat. Um, you, you, I, I said this before the broadcast got underway, but I'll note for our classes too. This is one of the most uh, attended programs we've ever had, like 120 classes across North America registered today because this is such a unique topic and such a special place. So I'm so glad we're getting the chance to highlight all this. All right, Avoca West, 4B, Glenview, Illinois. If you guys have a question for us, come on in. Hey guys. All right, here's Lydia, come on up. There you go. How many different species of birds have you seen in Tuck Tuck um, No Guide? Yeah. Um, raptor species. So the four that I focused on were the ones that are cliff nesters along the river system. But in terms of birds of prey in total in uh, Tuk Tuk No Guide. So you have the four main that I mentioned and then the snowy owl. And the short-eared owl use the area periodically. They're more uncommon. And then you also have the northern harrier, which actually nests in one of the most northern balsam popular stands in Canada, outside, just out north of the park, actually, all along the Hornaday River. So very unique. Um, and then you have the Jaegers. You have the Pomeranian Jaeger. You have the parasitic Jaeger and the common Jaeger. And they're all kind of very similar to the marsh, uh, the uh, northern harrier they hunt over marshy lands. They nest in tundra grounds. Um, they're scavengers. So then, yeah, the, you have those. And then the golden eagles coming up more and more, which we're noticing a little more, like I mentioned last year, was the first recorded. I'm assuming it's going to happen more. So there's about eight birds of prey species within the park. And then, sorry, the common raven we also have um, in the area. So they nest in Tuktunogide also. 
very, so, very cool. By the way, a golden eagle, I've seen one in my whole life. It was in Algonquin Provincial Park. It's one of the most majestic animals on this planet. But I encourage all our classes, truly, if you guys leave the program today and go looking for it, maybe you're on a drive, maybe you'll see them on the edge of a highway or in a forest, you'll probably see a bird of prey. They're really quite special creatures. So I hope you guys get the chance to do that when this is done. All right, Mr. Donati's class in Toronto. I know you've been having tech issues, but we're going to try and get you in for a good live question. Welcome in. Grade two threes. Does it want to work? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Can you guys hear us? Yep. Okay. Excellent. Um, I don't think yep. they can hear me because apparently my mic is not connecting to them. So I'm just going to tap in on my phone and ask if they have any questions. Give me one Perfect. second here. I'm just popping in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, sorry. What was that? We'll come back in a second once they've okay. come up with one, okay? Give you a second to get one from them, and then we'll come back to you. Thank you. Perfect. All right. We'll take one from YouTube in the meantime. Uh, Miss Gail's class wants to know, what's the biggest animal these birds of prey can eat? Like, do, are caribou in trouble? Do they have to look over their shoulder for any rough-legged hawks, or what's going on up there? Uh, not so much rough-legged hawks. The only one that kind of go outside of the uh, common, like, birds and wolves and stuff is the golden eagle. Golden eagles are no, known to hunt young sheep, young caribou, um, young muskox, all of that. Um, they have a unique hunting feature. So up in Ibibik National Park, the other park we focus on out towards uh, the Yukon, uh, it's a mountain region and actually it supports a dull sheep population. And we've recorded golden eagles taking out um, baby sheep off the mountains. They hit them off the mountain and feed on them for a few days. Yeah, so. It's so yeah. cool. It's so brutal and so cool at the same time. I mean, if you're a baby muskox, I've got to admit, you're probably going through life feeling pretty confident. You're thinking nothing's going to eat me, maybe a wolf. And then, you know, your parents all gather around you. You're pretty safe. But then the eagle comes in and gets you from the middle. That's no good. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's not quite that easy, but no, no. <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, being pr protected like that is kind of wild. Yeah. Well, let's head back to Mr. Nani's class, see if we got a question from them, and then we'll go to some YouTube ones before doing another round. We are whipping through these questions, guys. You guys are amazing. So in Toronto, question for us. Hey, Mr. Nani. Wants to work. Think about it. Yes. Mr. Nani, they're going back to you. Okay, okay. My volume is not coming into me. I'm having all these tech issues. Okay, sorry. So are we ready for a question? So let's have Marie start. Marie? I don't know. Okay, go for it. Okay, Marie, you can ask your question. Okay, Marie. You can ask your questions. Okay, you can start. How you can start. fast is the snow owl? How fast is the snowy owl? So we're getting ready. We're back to a fast question. No pressure at all. But I mean, you have to know. Okay, I'll look it up while you're trying to answer. <laughs> okay, I like that. I act I actually don't know. Um, I will straight up say that they're not very fast animals, though. They're they're swift animals. Um, when you see them in the tundra hunting, they're actually following very low to the ground, swooping over the contour, really just flying elegantly, basically just silently flapping every once in a while, nice strong flaps, gliding, using their ears and um, sight to be able to find their young, or not the young, sorry, the prey. So they're very uh, swift flyers, not very fast. I would say they're like, Slower-ish. Yeah. I thought the fastest Google search, Uncle Google always helps out in these things. About 46 miles per hour, 80 kilometers. So they are quick. They're faster than we can run by far. Yeah. Compared to some of those other birds, not so much. But they are very silent. If you look at owl's wings, the feathers are formed in such a way that they make them almost... You, you can't hear them at all as they fly by, which is such a magical experience. We've had live bird programs before. They're very, very special. All right. Let's dive in with some YouTube questions, folks. And then we'll go back for all our live classes. Uh, so many YouTube questions. By the way, everyone is very obsessed with the fact that a snowy owl is Hedwig, which I think is very important. So our Harry Potter reference of the day. I actually have one. On the screen behind you, you have these beautiful other versions of thank you in other languages. Could you tell us what those are and what languages they are? So this first one is Koyanidi. Yeah. Which is Anubalaptin. 
that's uh, the Inuit people up in the re region. You know, Haicho. Haicho is um. Dene. 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 So one of our parks is down in the Satu, right along the Great Bear Lake. So that's the Dene people down there. Um, De Delene community. Uh, and then Masi Cho is the uh, Gwich'in, Gwich'in uh, thank you, and then English thank you at the end. So it's all the local languages that we co-manage with. So Sao Dacho and the Satu. Um, and then we have historical sites in the Gwich'in settlement region and then our national parks in the Inibialwit settlement region. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Oh, we do a uh, secret path week every single year and indigenous languages are one of the most uh, loved and, and cherished things for all our classrooms. So every time we get the chance to do that and make sure our classes have the chance to say them as well, I think it's really special. So thank you for that. By the way, I also love how you can, you're so far north, you can say down there in Great Bear Lake. Uh, I yeah. heard the classes, look, look up Great Bear Lake when you're done this broadcast. There's very few things in the world that are above Great Bear Lake. Um, so uh, again, a, a testament to a special place you've got today. Ms. Gale's class wants to know, how did you discover all these species of raptors? And are there more that maybe you haven't discovered yet? When you go out with that 60 pound backpack, maybe you need like an 80 pound backpack to go a little further so you can find more raptors. What's going on? How do you find these and what might be out there? <laughs> um, raptors has kind of been a studied species for many, many years, right? Like it's gone back to generations and back in the 70s, 80s. And actually before Tuk Tunaga, it became a park there was DNWT did surveys uh, with a request from the community of Polytuck to do assessments and figure out what's using some of the Hornaday and Brock River uh, canyons for nesting and habitat in the summertime. So DNWT contracted a guy out of Yellowknife to do a hike and kind of monitor, figure out what's using the area before it became a park. And then when it once it became a park, we actually... Um, got part of the National Peregrine Falcon Recovery Program that was happening back from the 80s, 90s, 2000s, up until about 2015. Cool. Um, and it was an every, a five-year survey. Every five years, we conducted an aerial survey along these canyons, and it was all part of the recovery strategy, recovery plan for the Peregrine Falcons because they were listed in species at risk. Um, for a while, due to like um, pesticide control down in the States, DDT specifically in the 60s and 70s, being sprayed on fields, and then it actually affected peregrine falcons' uh, egg structure. So the eggs were becoming thinner and thinner, and when the adults were sitting on it, it would crush them. So peregrine, our surveys for raptors have been going on for years and years in the park, so we kind of just... In the past five years, we realized that we needed to start monitoring these species that are going to be affected by climate change. And we slowly did some data searching on what's been done. And that's how we kind of figured out the four main cliff species. And then as years go on with climate change, we are going to find new species. Yep. Like I said, the golden eagle last year, or sorry, bald eagle last year was a new species. I'm sure in the future, through my career here at Parks Canada, we'll have the same issue of finding new species. That was like the coolest, most detailed answer of all time. We threw in like DDT from the past. We got climate change. We got the fact that like Parks Canada pays people to go out and explore and do epic expeditions. Like this is the coolest program ever. Um, okay, we're going to dive back in with our live classes. Take a few from YouTube. Time flies and you're having fun. But let's head back to Bernie, Manitoba, Rolling Acres. If you have a second question, come on back in. Hey, guys. Hi, we do have a question. What? Vancouver is lost in Oh, could you repeat that a little louder or have your teacher repeat it? Sorry. <laughs> okay, we were wondering which animal is most endangered now. Yeah, most endangered raptor, guys. Um, I'm going to just focus on my park because raptors outside my park is huge and I'm not too familiar with them. But I would say the most uh, concerning one would still be the uh, peregrine falcon because you're still in the recovery, right? It's a successful recovery pro program that's been gone through um, species at risk. And it's one of the few, well, there's a few other successful, but it's one of the more um, publicized recovery that's happened by research and recovering a population in the natural um, habitat. So they actually did more than just monitoring. They actually took young or adults in and laid the eggs and raised these young, got them to fledglings, then released them back into the um, wild. So it was a big recovery nice. uh, project. So these species can still do a big 
collapse if anything ever affects them. Climate change could be one, food source can be another. So it's, I would say the peregrine falcon would be still a species that's the most at risk of declining or becoming extinct in our park. But I'm really glad. In our you park. Mentioned, yeah, yeah. But I'm glad you mentioned some of the, the positive elements to it, too. I think with conservation, it's really easy to get bogged down with a lot of negative details. And to note that people can go in and do interventions and help these species recover, I think is really, really important. So I'm so glad we got a chance to, to hear that today. Um, Miss Mustard, I'm coming to you guys. I'll take a few from YouTube. We'll wrap up with Abaco West. Uh, Miss Mustard, come on in. Unmute your mic and you are good to go. How big are snow eagle's eggs? Ooh, snowy owl, snowy owl or, or bald eagle? Snow owl. Snowy owl eggs, perfect. Right there. A replica right here. So it's about this big and in comparison, here's the golden eagle's egg. So it's quite significant. And then here's a pair. This one's a peregrine falcon. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. So next to it. Yeah. Yeah. So very similar. Quite small. Yeah. Not, compared. <laughs> yeah. Like if we put our finger up to it, it's kind of not even. Yeah. The, yeah. See, the point have props. Like this is the key to every good broadcast is to have things behind you. Uh, all right. I'm going to take a few quick ones from YouTube and then we'll go uh, with our final two live questions. So many questions. Okay. Mr. LeBron's class has like a bajillion questions and that's an exact figure. And so Raphael wants to know, what time of year can most raptors be found? Are they there all year? Is it better in the summer, winter? What's the deal? Um, summer is the best time. Specifically, we conduct our survey end of June going into July. And the reason we do that is because all the four main species are still either laying eggs, sitting in their nests, or feeding their young. So they're all hanging out in their home range close to their territory. If we do it in august all of the young and adults will be flying around it'll be hard to distinguish between the juveniles and uh, adults if you're not uh, comfortable in identifying them so the best time to monitor is end of june july but the best time to see all of the species i would say mid june to about mid august is a good time to see all the species within took to no guy i'll have to book my trip soon okay good to know yeah. um Let's take one from London, Miss Sting's class. They want to know, speaking of big groups of birds, do falcons travel or live in groups, or are they lone creatures, like loner falcons out in the plains, or are they like a bajillion falcons together? Second use of bajillion. Another loners. Um, especially nesting times, they're very territorial to their um, nest site, and then they also have a home range where they kind of stick within a general area for all their hunting. Um where they food and stuff and then their home their nest range is right near their nest so they're pretty defensive they won't let another um adult nest within we found within about 0.8 of a kilometer of each other they were the yes. average distance between nests were so they're very territorial and loners <laughs> very territorial and loners that could be our tagline for the next time we do this broadcast uh the french yeah, one later all right. Um, guys, just a quick note. I know we're at the 43 minute mark for classes that might need to leave. There is a Padlet. So if you guys want to share more questions, if you're like Mr. LeBrun's class and every student in the class has a question, head to the Padlet, share it there. We'll make sure it gets answered the next couple of days. I encourage you to do that as soon as you can. Um, and let's take one last one from YouTube before we wrap up with our two last live classes. So both Ms. Dester's class, Chloe in uh, Kansas, and Mr. McEwen, Joel in Calgary want to know, why do they have different wingspans? So is there a reason that you've got tiny falcons, bigger eagles? Is it just exploiting different resources or, or niches in the environment? What's going on? Uh, you pretty much hit it there. Exploiting different resources, the niches, right? Like I said, they all use the same type of habitat within the park. So if they were all the exact same species, exact same features, same flights, same size, they would all be hunting the same food and the competition would increase. So if there's more adults hunting the same food source, their food source is going to go down, which will cause the adults and young to go down because they're hunting the same thing and they're just di di diminishing everything. So with the eagles having larger wingspans, larger body, larger weight, they can hunt the larger animals. Um, rough leg hawks, they'll hunt the voles on the ground species because they're not fast, they're not swift. They'll just grab them off the ground. And then the falcons, they're the swift, agile species that can actually hunt out of the sky they ambush birds out of the air they get things square out of the sky basically 
Uh, I, we've had programs on before talking about peregrine falcon hunting techniques. It's brutal and really cool at the same time. If you're a pigeon just flying along and suddenly something comes flying at 200 kilometers an hour and more and knocks you out of the sky, it's quite alarming, I imagine. Um, less so than the muskox we talked about earlier, though. It's very alarming all around for the prey of these creatures. Um, Miss Donati's class, you guys shared a question in the chat. I'm sorry you're having some tech issues. Um, where in Canada, so this is a question from Olamaid and uh, Malik, where in Canada has the most eagles? You might know this offhand. Is there a special place where there's like all the eagles gather? Uh, or do we not know? Um, I would say Southern BC has a, quite a large population just because it's so temperate there. Um, yeah, and there's quite a few bald eagles around there. I've spent some time living there before. And I think, yeah, I would see a bald eagle like daily. Wow. It's a... Uh... Yeah, so in BC specifically, the golden eagles in the fall time about September, mid September. I don't know the exact date, but you can actually see all the bald e or, uh, golden eagles migrating over the mountains using the mountain uh, winds, wind current to push them over. So there's a, it's a very short window that you can look up in the mountains and see gold, golden eagles constantly migrating south over BC. But okay, BC so would probably be the highest concentration. I mean, uh, wanted... let's face it. Southern BC is the most of everything. I mean, they're they're very they're very proud of that. We're all a little jealous. The rest of Canada, but what we want is you to go down there and tell us about those golden eagles. I know you're up in Inuvik now, and this is amazing. It's an amazing program. But like, you're our guide for all the birds from now on. So we're gonna figure that out later. Right. And make eagle spot, okay. Um, one final like question, that. folks. Let's head to Africa West to wrap up, and then we'll make sure all our classes have the resources they need to keep the learning going. Uh, but Illinois, take us away with one final question. What is the most rarest animal to see in Tuk Tuk Nogue? Nice. The rarest animal of any kind. You talked about the falcon. Is there a rarer creature in general? I'd say wolverines are quite rare. Um, I know they exist in the park for sure. Hayden, any thoughts? Uh, rare species. Well, the golden eagle is pretty rare because it was only spotted once last year, so it, <laughs> it uses the park now. Um, but yeah, the wolverine, like the one that lives in the park and uses it, probably the wolverine. They're very elusive and yeah. they can hear you come in miles and miles before you actually even get close to them. So. We've done two wolverine programs in our past, and people who study wolverines for their entire lives are lucky if they see like two. Like 20 years looking for wolverines, they'll maybe catch a few on camera, but actually see two in the wild. It's usually the wolverine disappearing over the horizon over the next hill. So I, I'm really glad we got that question. It's such a special part of the world where you guys live, and thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Uh, before we bring in our classes to say farewell, I just want to note again, if you want to check out this program, all our other programs in the series, check out our road trip site. If you want to uh, share your experience in this program uh, and contribute for a potential chance to win a prize, go to the Canadian Geographic Education website website. We'll put that in the link to all our registered classes as well. And if you want to inundate Alan and Baden with a bajillion questions, that's my number of the day, apparently. It's not intentional. Head to our Padlet link. So it's a virtual whiteboard. Share your questions there. We'll leave that up for a couple days if you want to get them answered. We'd love to hear from you and see all those great questions you have. And just thank you all so much for joining us. Now, before we wrap up with our classes, you two, is there a final message you want to share about your park, about Raptors that we can leave our kids with to take home? Just uh, thanks for listening. It's really great to talk about the North and yeah, explain to Southern audiences what it's like up here and talk about the really cool species that we get to study up here. And if you want to know more, you can follow our Facebook page, Parks Canada NWT, or uh, look up our websites on Google. We will get that to absolutely everyone after the broadcast is done too. And so thank you all so much. Here we go. We're going to bring in our classes. Rolling Acres, Miss Mustard, Avica West, Miss Denoni's class. You are all in our broadcast. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.